Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and we are once again celebrating 10 years on YouTube. We are pretty far down the list. I think we just passed halfway now, so we're almost through our 10 videos that are important to me, or 10 videos that have made up who I am. And I don't think any of you are surprised to see a Slenderman video here. If there's one Creepypasta monster I could absolutely say is responsible for making me who I am, who's not Jeff the Killer, then it would be Slenderman. Slenderman, I feel like, has ingrained himself into just about every facet of what creepypastas are, or what online horror is, or what ARGs are, and I don't think I could ever get away from talking about creepypastas without talking about creepypasta monsters, or talking about creepypasta OCs, or talking about, I guess, what at this point is considered to either be classics or memes. So, Tall, Thin, and Faceless is absolutely one of the best Slenderman stories, at least in my opinion, that I've ever recorded. And I've recorded it two or three times by now, but as a part of this series, it is absolutely something that made me who I am. This is Tall, Thin, and Faceless by an unknown anonymous author. Walls. White walls. White, padded walls. Day in and day out. White, padded walls. Let me tell you why I see white, padded walls day in and day out. I am, or at least according to several doctors, Certifiably insane. Hallucinations, paranoia, schizophrenia, multiple personality disorder, the list goes on. I was a normal working class man living the American dream. I had a wife, two children. My income was high, my debt was low. I had it all, and then... And then things started to go wrong. They started to go in a direction I... I couldn't even fathom. My wife and I had always wanted to go to the British Isles, but for the longest time, the money wasn't there. It took seven years and two promotions before we could even begin to think realistically. Anyway, after months of careful planning and preparation, we were on a plane flying over the Atlantic Ocean. Just me and her. No kids, no job. Nothing but beautiful scenery and relaxation for 24 straight days. Fast forward a week. Having taken in many of the big city sites, we decided to see some of the smaller places out in the countryside. So we packed a small bag of essentials, we took a cab into the rural side of England, and this is where things this is where things start to go wrong. Not the the whole world is coming to an end wrong, even though it sure feels like it. Over the it was just wrong. We came across an old tailor in a moderately decorated cabin. He said he'd been making suits for over 65 years. My interest was piqued. I decided to splurge a little bit and buy one. Nothing beats the craftsmanship of a well-tailored suit. After paying for it and calling for a cab, a picture on a wall caught my eye. It was old. It was black and white, mid-50s. It was a very tall, very slim suited man standing on a grassy plain. His face appeared to be smudged out. It was old. I didn't think much of it. Even so, something about this picture was unnerving. It gave an odd vibe. It felt almost menacing. I inquired about the photo, but the odd man refused to talk about it. That just added fuel to my mental fire. Days upon days had passed. My wife and I took in every site, every castle, every grassy knoll we possibly could. But alas, eventually we had to go home. Part of us wanted to stay, but we were exhausted. There was no way we could spend any longer there. Our flight back home was vague, as we were both asleep most of the time. The drive back home was hazy. We just wanted to relax, and as I pulled into the driveway, something was... off. You know, something just... it didn't feel right. I got that same feeling I had when I saw the picture inside the tailor's home. It was a it was a feeling of dread, curiosity. 
I didn't want to continue, but my mind forced me to. I stepped out of my car, and when I stood onto the concrete, my legs suddenly gave out. I fell onto the ground and onto my right hand, and I found myself unable to force myself up. I must be more tired than I thought. My wife helped me up and supported me up to the bedroom. I felt I was going to be asleep for a very long time. Or so I thought. That night I was plagued by nightmares of the suited man on the grassy plain. It wasn't really a bad dream as much as it was his presence haunting me in my subconscious, just, just standing there. Unnaturally tall, unnaturally thin, standing there without a face, without an identity. And no, no matter how hard I tried, his face never focused. It was as though the picture had come alive in my thoughts, but remained unchanged. This went on until I had been abruptly awoken by the sound of the smashing of a lamp. I raced down two flights of stairs, leading from the bedroom to the living room. Armed with only the brick that we used as a doorstop, I slowly crept to where the only lamp in our house used to be. I knelt down to pick up a piece to examine when I, when I felt a slight a slight blow of wind from behind me like a person running past. I shot up faster than a startled cat. I spun around to see what or who it was. My eyes had still not adjusted, so surrounding me was nothing but darkness. My next thought was to, to listen. You know? Nothing. Not a single thing. Not even the sound of a house settling. Maybe it was my nightmare or fatigue playing tricks on me. Maybe we had a slight tremor that caused the lamp to inch off the table. Regardless, I was tired. I sorely wanted to get some nightmare-free sleep. But it didn't happen. Throughout the rest of the night, the slender man was everywhere within my dreams. He was a bit curious, though, so he only, he only ever seemed to cautiously hide behind trees. Only in the original photo was he completely exposed. Even subconsciously, I wished that I, I hadn't moved next to a forest knowing that he could be lurking. Watching me. Analyzing me. It didn't take long to force myself awake. 10.46 a.m. I looked to my left. I looked to my right. My wife was calmly sleeping. Lucky her. I dragged myself out of bed and slowly made my way downstairs. I half expected the TV to be blaring with my kids' eyes glued to the screen, but then I realized they were at their grandma's house. They were due back that day. Eh, I was going to miss the quiet. It was all right. I missed my kids even more. I continued down the stairs, hoping to get a game of solitaire in on the computer when something made me feel very weak and hollow. The lamp wasn't broken but it wasn't brand new either. Someone took the pieces and shoddily glued them back together, and the glue wasn't glue. It was black and rubbery, like tar. I would have tasted it for origin, but that, that never is a good idea. My wife needed to wake up, and soon. I was starting to panic. I explained what happened the night before, about the lamp and the nightmares and such. She just rolled her eyes and told me I was on something. <laughs> Wives. Sometimes I think they do it on purpose. Still, feeling uneasy from this morning, I managed to force myself to look out into the forest behind our house. It was very calm. Nothing out of the ordinary. It wasn't completely dark, so it didn't look nearly as ominous as it usually did at night. I was badly lamenting this night in particular. And suddenly I saw a light out of the corner of my eye. One that caused me to nearly jump out of my skin. It was just it was just the kids being dropped off. <laughs> I swear I was thinking too much into this. I couldn't keep my nerves steady half the time. Hours passed. We played with the children, we put them to bed, we relaxed on the couch. My wife was asleep on my chest. I was nodding off. I slowly closed my eyes. It wasn't long before the quiet was broken and my wife and I were woken up. A window broke upstairs. In a panic flurry, we ran up the stairs as fast as we could. Our eldest son, scared out of his mind, said it came from his brother's room. Without even thinking, I kicked the door in. Only the nightlight in the far corner brought light into the pitch-black room. And there he was. 
the man from my dreams, the slender man hovering over my son's bed. Having seen him, I acted without even knowing what was going on. Punches were thrown, long black tendrils whipped all around. The last thing I remember was being held tightly above the ground and thrown against a wall. And that's when I blacked out. When I came to, my wife was in tears. I had three cracked ribs. My son was gone. The Slender Man had my son, and there was nothing I could do. But I knew... I knew he was going to come back. And that was when I would get him. The rest of the day was full of emotion. My wife could hardly stop crying. Our other son was in a constant state of shock. I could, I could barely think straight. I did, however, manage to call the police. I told them my son had been abducted by a man in a long black suit. I kept the details of the tendrils to myself in fear that they wouldn't believe me, but that was the least of my worries. I needed to figure out when he would return. Police showed up and took each of our statements. They examined my son's room. They did a quick scour of the forest outside. It seemed like not a single piece of evidence was found. They had begun to leave when something hanging from high up on a branch caught their eyes. It was a piece of material. Black. Pinstripe. Much like the suit I bought while I was on vacation. I pointed this out to the police and they inquired to see my suit. I gladly showed them. When they opened the closet door, what they found was beyond belief. Wrapped in my now tattered suit was my son. Completely drenched in blood and he didn't look conscious. Both myself and the police were shocked and disgusted and, and that's when I blacked out. When I came to, I was in an unfamiliar place. Gray painted walls, small windows on one of them. One exceptionally bland table. And great, I was in an interrogation room. I sat there alone for the good part of an hour before actual human life entered the room with me. And now my memory is a bit hazy at this point, so I'll, I'll try to sum up the conversation as best as I could. The officer said, he said, he said that your son didn't survive. Deepest sympathies to you and your family. You've not been proven guilty, but evidence leans towards it. A further investigation must be held. You have to be brought back home, but you'll be under constant supervision, and so on and so forth. I was driven back home in the back of a police cruiser. Last time I was there was in high school, and vandalism was the cool thing to do. I was welcomed with open arms by my still-sobbing wife and my emotionless son. Going back wasn't easy. Well, thankfully, we didn't have to stay long. The police explained that we were going to stay at the hotel for a few days. We gathered our things when a picture from our fridge caught my eye. It was a picture that my my late son drew. When I saw it, my heart nearly stopped. See, in the, in the cutest crayon drawing you can imagine was my son standing next to a tall, faceless man in a black suit. I made sure no one was around to see me stuff the picture in my pocket. The hotel was what you would normally expect. Simple wallpaper, two twin beds, one TV, cheap, flowery design on everything else. It would have to do since we were stuck there. We settled in, placing out our stuff and lying down. I, on the other hand, I went to the bathroom. The only place I knew was private. I locked the door. I took the picture out of my pocket. I scoured the page for clues. To no avail. All that was there was the crude drawing and his name scribbled into the bottom corner. The thing that unnerved me the most was the fact that the slender man had no face, no, no identity. Not a single outstanding feature. It rattled me to the core. But I had enough stress from today. I, I needed sleep. I needed it badly. The night was rough, but I still managed to. Not a single dream with the Slender Man either. Then a, a banging came from the door. Being half asleep the whole time, it scared the shit out of me. I turned to my right. 5.14 a.m. That's we're gonna roll. I dragged myself out of bed and very slowly I opened the door. It was the police officer that drove us here. He had a look of panic on his face. 
He said that my son was missing. Nothing clicked. It took me a minute to wake up and grasp reality again. My son's body was missing. Snatched right from the hospital, but this time I knew where he was. I had to get back to the forest. I had to find the remains of my suit. It was the only way to stop the Slender Man, but I knew it wasn't going to be that easy. I asked the police officer if he could drive me back to my house, th that I had forgotten something. He pondered a moment, and finally he obliged. This time, I had been allowed to sit in the passenger seat. The ride there was quiet. I tried to get some sleep. He didn't, he didn't start any conversations, and when we got there, I was careful to make sure that no one else saw me. I entered the house through the front door and quickly escaped out the back and headed for the forest. It was still very dark out. Traversing the heavily wooded area was not easy. The only light that came through was that of the moon, so I walked almost blind, hoping to find some scrap of my suit. It, it seemed to be impossible until, amid the darkness, I saw a scrap of paper. The white of it stood out like a sore thumb. I leaned down to pick it up, and when I turned it around, what I saw completely horrified me. It was another drawing by my son, with both him and the Slender Man. But this one was different. There were three other people, a boy the same height as him, an older-looking girl, and another boy as big as the girl. And it dawned on me, this it was my family. My family. My son drew us in this in, in with this slender man. And then I saw a beam of light. It was a police officer. I ran up to him and I showed him the picture. I explained that my family is in great danger. And all he told me was there was nothing he could do. He said that he said that we should go back to the car and we could go to the hotel. A million thoughts ran through my head. Should I concede? Should I resist? What I did next is is peanuts compared to what was about to unfold, but I didn't know about it looking back. And I didn't want to. I gave in to the police officer's request. And I began to head back to the car, and while he had his back turned to me, I picked up a fair six stone, and I brought it down on his head. He staggered a bit, and then he fell to the ground, and I took the car keys off of him, and I ran towards the car. It was still dark. I needed to get back to the hotel. I screeched to an immediate halt in the hotel parking lot, and I ran towards the door where they were staying. I swung open the door, and behold, the one thing I was trying to prevent, amidst all the blood that painted the room with three bodies making circles around the Slender Man. He turned and he looked at me, his hollow, non-existent eyes staring deep into me, emotions I'd never felt before, emotions without names filled my brain and body. It was like he was, he was making me feel everything he ever had. And with an outstretched hand, he said only one thing, one thing that would be burned into the back of my mind forever. Help me. Sirens came from behind me. I turned around to see the police cruisers pulling into the parking lot and watching them get out. Using car doors and shields with their guns aimed at me, I raised my hands above my head. I slowly, I slowly looked behind myself to see the Slender Man fade away into nothing, leaving only a tattered suit and a heap on the floor. He killed my family. My life would never be the same, and yet something told me I was never going to see him again. I'd never be able to exact revenge, even if I figured out how. Everything up until the white padded walls isn't exactly clear to me, and I've been told that after they saw me at the hotel with DNA on my suit, I was made the primary suspect. And after they arrested me and subjected me to the frivolous testing, to which they got nothing more than unintangible noises, I was submitted to this place. To the white padded walls. The same white padded walls I see all day, every day. No one will know what happened to me and my family. The emotions that were broadcasted to me caused me to lose my ability of speech. And now all I can do is write and draw. And I write out the emotions that the Slender Man felt. I draw the things that he's seen. They would keep me here. 
I'm a victim of another man's emotion. Sometimes I feel like I've, I've become him. Like we are the same being. That day I learned something. We were slender. Hey there, kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta. I wanted to say thank you for watching tonight's video or listening to tonight's podcast episode. And also wanted to let you know that if you're interested in getting some Dungeons and Dragons Creepypasta or many, many other things themed tea, you can always check out my wife's tea shop at etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. And I want to give a very special thank you to all of you who support me on Patreon, because quite honestly, you guys help me keep the lights on in my house. And I can't thank you enough for that. A very special thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Canon Lando Higuchi, Chumbinski, Bobby Carmen, Nico Kyle, Tristan Pelton, Chase Burnett, Deanna Krauss, G. Weevil 3, Chris Lovin, Freddy Krueger, Dr. Stein and Mr. Happy, Miranda Jeffries, Hulgunshi, Justin Johnson, Raven Hart, Unknown Nobody, Michael Scarborough, Kazen, this is my real name, no shit, Jason V.B. Wilson, Infernal One, Jimbo the Hutt, Caspian, Jordan Nels, Hades Nephew, Jordan Wayne Deckard, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Someone You Love, S-Man, Kiri the Sloth, Liam Newman, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Nina Smith, Raphael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Paulson, and Corey Kenshin. Thank you guys so much. Like, seriously. Thank you guys so, so much. And if you would like to be able to join them, you always can at patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. I love you guys. Seriously. All of you who support on Patreon, who follow, who subscribe, those of you who listen, and those of you who lurk, Thank you for the amazing 10 years and sweet dreams. <laughs>